assessment and surveys. Um, as I said, this meeting will be recorded and posted later. Um, so today's presenter is Daniel Volk from Cleveland Metro Parks, and he is the Forest Health Project Coordinator and doing a boatload of work on beech leaf disease. So with that, let me stop my share. And Daniel, I'll let you share your screen. Okay, you guys see that all right? Mm -hmm. Awesome. Well, thank you, Marnie and Kathy and everyone for joining this morning. I'm coming to you live from Cleveland, um, where I'll be talking about beech leaf disease, the history, some treatment options, and uh, a lot of survey work that we have to do still. So beech, uh, American beech more specifically, is a widespread uh, tree species found in forests all across the eastern U.S. It's found all throughout Ohio and is a hugely important ecological species. Um, you know, you see this, this top left picture here of a hollowed out beech that is still alive, um, and it provides valuable habitat for wildlife. Uh, and we also see that the beech nuts that are produced are extremely valuable as well. In fact, so much so that I hardly see any beech nuts hit the floor because uh, wildlife tend to eat them up before they even fall off. Um, so it's really, really important tree species, which is unfortunate why we now have the introduction of beech leaf disease. Uh, BLD was found first in Lake County, Ohio in 2012 and you see these dark intervenal banding patterns um, in this picture here to the right that are often found first in shrubs or the lower canopy. The various symptoms that we see, um, we start off with asymptomatic, healthy, normal beech leaves. Um, you see these on the left uh, near the hand here that are very, light green, they're thin, very papery thin in fact, um, normal shape and size. What we see when we have beech leaf disease symptoms first is mild symptoms that are typically normal sized and shaped leaves, uh, but you see this dark intervenal banding pattern develops. Um, and, and two, I want to point out that sometimes it it's difficult to spot when you've got a lot of overlapping leaves. So these are actually two asymptomatic leaves that are overlapping, um, but there's lots of banding on these leaves here. More advanced or heavy symptoms, as I call them, <clears throat> are leaves that are shrunken, they're curled, they're really dark and thick and leathery in texture. Um, you know, it's a very noticeable difference when you feel the leaves. Uh, and these tend to um, be more advanced symptoms. We see these after longer periods of time, typically. So one thing that was noticed was this buds that produce leaves often tend to produce leaves of similar condition. And here's a great photo uh, by Connie, who um, was able to show that we've got one bud here that produced all asymptomatic leaves but right next to it is a bud that produced heavy symptom leaves. And then over here, you've got mild symptoms. So all three symptoms can show up on the same branch, just on different twigs. And it's not only affecting our native American beach, but it does also affect ornamental beach as well, such as European beach, which are common landscape trees, uh, such as the copper, tricolor, or weeping beach. Um, it's also been known to affect Chinese beech and Oriental beech from uh, arboretum specimen. So the field observations, the bottom up perspective, I, I like to, to say, uh, has two different approaches. First being that when you are looking for the initial BLD symptoms, you want to look in the lower canopy and in the shrub layer. So this is a great image of somewhere that you would want to target when you're looking in the forest. Um, 
Another bottom up approach I like to take is looking as a silhouette from below. So this is a great image uh, that was taken below the leaves, below the branch. And looking up into the canopy, you can see the sunlight produces that silhouette of the banding pattern. So it's really, really noticeable when you're looking from below. And here's another example. These are the exact same uh, leaves. One was taken from above on the left, and it's very difficult to, to see that banding pattern. But if you look on the right and you're, you're looking at that branch from below, I think it's quite obvious to see that. Other symptoms that we tend to see after uh, having BLD for a little while is aborted buds. So these buds tend to stay on branches, but they never develop leaves, even through July. They're typically smaller in size, they, they dry out, uh, they become papery and kind of crumble as you try to touch them. And what that ultimately leads to is twig and branch dieback, and, and even more so is reduced canopy. So this photo here was taken in 2011 before beech leaf disease uh, appeared. It's a nice full canopy, you can see that. And then the photo that I'm gonna pop up in a second here is in 2016, so five years later. And beech leaf disease was present in this forest for three years at this point. So BLD first showed up here in 2014. This is three years worth of damage to these beech trees. It's pretty astounding if you compare these pictures. And I, and I have to always try to remember what a healthy beech looks like because where I'm at, I just, I don't see any of these anymore. Uh, the picture on the left was taken uh, from a healthy beech stand and it's got a full canopy there. It's a small sapling. The picture on the right is a dead sapling. These are found all throughout Cleveland and, and the greater Cleveland area. And, um, you know, there's just, it, it's pretty devastating when you compare the healthy versus faster and mortality happen faster in small trees and saplings. We do have large mature trees that are declining too. So this one in the background there, you see um, has a very, very reduced canopy. There are only a handful of leaves there. You really have to use binoculars to, uh, to find them. So um, the decline does happen in large trees. It just typically happens at a slower rate. So I'll give you a little bit of background about some of the projects that Cleveland Metro Parks has been doing. Um, we have vegetation monitoring plots that are established around our 24,000 acres. They're distributed across the entire park system and we reassess these on a five-year schedule. So plots that were established in 2010 were reassessed in 2015 and so on. Uh, 203 of those plots had beech, and uh, there were almost 6,000 stems that we looked at of various sizes. So we were able to track the spread of beech leaf disease in our park system. So of those 203 plots, 78 of them did have beech leaf disease by the, their second, the uh, second assessment there. And of course, none of the plots had uh, beech leaf disease in the initial assessment of 2010 through uh, 2014. So what we see over time is that in 2015, 20% of plots had BLD. And we fast forward to 2018, now we have 62% of plots with BLD. And even more so, we have 92% of stems were affected. So this isn't just something where a couple of trees get it, uh, you know, with a couple of leaves. This is pervasive throughout our entire park system at this point. And in some of those stands that have had it for a long time, our most recent assessment in 2018 documented a 7% mortality rate which means 96 out of our 1,300 plus stems died. 
Now I will say that most of them were small stems, less than 10 centimeters. But again, we have to remember that this happened all within a four year time period since we first got um, BLD in Cleveland Metro Parks in 2014 through 2018. So all this is happening over a pretty short time span. Nine of our plots um, were documented as having mortality. But what's more striking to me is that three of those plots contained 86 of those 96 dead stems. So they were all concentrated in this heavy area, which were the ones that were hit first. So they had been uh, detected earlier and has had it longer. And we see this severity, this mortality increase over time. So what we're expecting is that increased mortality rate, along with increasing in the, the tree size that we find mortality in. Again, since we were able to track the, um, the, the actual spread within Cleveland Metro Parks, we see that in Lake County, there were two initial BLD detection sites in the Northeast. Um, that was in 2012, and we first got BLD in 2014 in our Eastern reservations in red. And our entire park system. Now I want to mention that that landscape features will be important to uh, consider here as Cleveland and Cuyahoga County is a highly urbanized area and very fragmented. We do have a lot of connectivity within Cleveland Metro Parks as you see there's a nice line or a ring around our emerald necklace here um, that allows for connectivity but we do and we have seen faster movement east as you get into Pennsylvania where they've got vast areas of connected habitat. And so the size and the scale of that protected land is going to influence how fast BLD spreads across the landscape. But we, we did see it within our park system spread about 17 kilometers per year. So what we decided to do was follow individual trees over time. So again, across our 24,000 acres, we, we established 13 plots, which we reassessed on an annual basis now rather than a five-year cycle. And we targeted about 20 trees per plot. So we ended up with 302 trees that we've been tracking since 2015. And what we see from this is looking at the normal leaves, the healthy asymptomatic leaves. Um, in the first, the initial year, year zero, we really are seeing all, all leaves are healthy. Um, in year one, we see a slight decline and then it just continues to decline um, up until year five, which was our most recent year for assessment. The median um, amount of normal leaves is 20%. What that means is 80% of what should be there, the canopy, is either dead or dying, or is filled with mild or heavy symptoms. And again, this is gonna happen faster in small trees than large trees, but we're seeing a pretty rapid decline over a short time period. So now I'm gonna jump to some projects that we've uh, been working on with USDA Forest Service. They provided Cleveland Metro Parks funding in 2018 to um, work on a couple of different projects, one of them being symptom progression. So since this is such a new disease, we don't really have all the information we need. Um, we, we need to establish a basic biology, a basic research to, to understand what's going on here. So these early leaves that you see here on the right um, were taken in May, right at leaf out. And we could see leaf symptoms uh, pretty early on, uh, but we really didn't know if they were changing over time, if you, know, you start off asymptomatic and become mild and then become heavy, or really what's going on here. So we really just needed to understand better what is happening. So what we did was we marked multiple candidate trees in early spring 2019 
And we went out and took pictures every two weeks of these leaves to see how they changed over the season. Uh, we were able to follow 74 leaves from uh, four trees, one branch per tree. So this is an example here of one of the trees that was taken May 16th last year. There were nine leaves present and you can see pretty early on, again, immediately we see these symptoms. So uh, leaves one and two are mild and three through nine are heavily symptomatic. You can see they're very curled, they're, they're a different color and texture, uh, and they even have some necrotic tissue on them. Uh, you'll also notice at the very end here, point out with the cursor, um, there's an aborted bud as well, which, which failed to develop leaves throughout the entire season. So we'll fast forward just to mid-season here, August 8th, and pretty striking, we've seen five leaves fall off. There are only four of the original nine remaining. Uh, there's a lot more necrotic tissue developing as these leaves are, uh, well, they will fall off within weeks or months. Um, in fact, all of the heavily symptomatic leaves fell off early here, whereas none of the mild or on some other trees, um, healthy or asymptomatic leaves, none of the asymptomatic or mild leaves fell off any earlier than uh, October, which you know, is when we would start expecting leaves to fall off. Uh, one other thing I'll mention is that later in the season, we do have a little bit of yellowing or chlorotic tissue develop here on some of the leaves. This doesn't always happen, but you can see it. Um, and then the other thing you'll notice is that these, the banding pattern didn't change from um, you know, early May, early leaf out until the end of season. So if a leaf emerges with three bands, it has three bands throughout the entire season. So we really need to figure out what the heck is causing beech leaf disease. And so that same funding, uh, pot of money from USDA Forest Service, now included Holden Forests and Gardens, um, USDA uh, Agricultural Research Service, and then also partners from Ontario, Canada. So David Burke was, was spearheading this from Holden Forests and Gardens. And what happened was uh, David McCann from Ohio Department of Agriculture found this nematode and thought that this might be a good avenue to follow. So this research group decided to inoculate leaves and buds with, with nematodes, and they were able to actually get symptoms to, to be produced when they were injecting nematodes into buds. And so you can see down here this, this nice image taken of uh, nematodes here. So they're, they're just microscopic uh, round worms. So this group, including Sharon Reed from Ontario, decided to continue their investigation with nematodes. And they recently came out with this publication following the uh, occurrence and, and population numbers of nematodes over time. And they're seeing that they remain pretty low throughout most of the season, but they explode in, um, in October and especially late October. And then they immediately crash again in which case they're finding that they likely overwinter either in buds or in fallen leaves on the ground. And so trying to understand the life cycle and again, the basic biology here of what's going on so that we can figure out what to do and how to address this moving forward. And so one thing that is probably on a lot of your minds is, well, what do we do about this? Um, so armed with some of that basic biology and background, uh, Davy Tree and uh, Cleveland Metro Parks here decided to partner up and try an experimental uh, treatment option. So this is a phosphite compound which is injected into the soil um, and the phosphite was originally used for citrus greening in Florida from a viral pathogen um, but in general this phosphite has a um, immune system boost to it. So it'll, it'll give plants a little bit extra uh, boost to their immune system and potentially um, you know, some extra nutrients and allow them to, to uh, survive a little longer. So I'll show you some preliminary data that we have on about a third of the trees. 
Uh, these treatments were done in spring and summer, so twice a year from 2017 up until uh, this year. Um, we're going to continue that treatment later this summer. And we always do the condition assessment every September just to stay consistent. So what we see looking at overall canopy cover with the red line being the control and the blue line being the treatment, uh, we are seeing that in 2016 they were very similar um, and they both decline after that, but the treatment seems to decline slower than the control group. Um, so it does look like there's a little bit of an impact here um, from, the, from the treatment. We do other canopy assessments as well, looking at the percentage of fine dead branches. So these are recently dead twigs. Um, and we see the control continues to increase up near 50%, but the treatment is staying pretty well below 20% um, over this time. So we're starting to see that separation between control and treatment. And then lastly, I'll just show you the percentage of healthy leaves. Um, again, we're, we are seeing a decline in both, but the decline is slower in the treated group and there's, they seem to be hanging on a little bit better um, than the control group. So this does look promising. We're going to go out and, and continue to do assessments and treatments this year. And uh, we'll, we'll group in the remainder of the trees and get a more robust sample size there but it does look promising. I'll also mention that additional treatments are being uh, experimented by Bartlett tree experts who are using emamectin benzoate, which is a, a general insecticide. Uh, in fact, for those of you with pets, if you treat for heartworm, it's a similar class of medicine um, treatment for heartworm as it is here. Uh, so potentially, maybe reducing those nematode numbers. And so last fall in 2019, um, there was an experimental treatment that began in a natural forest setting in Cleveland Metro Parks. Uh, but even before that, they were working with Holden Forest and Gardens to, uh, to do these treatments in a greenhouse setting. Both of these are still ongoing and you know, we'll, we'll be able to provide data um, at a later point. And um, I don't have anything on this slide, but I know there was a mention of potentially cutting down trees or, or pruning. And again, because we just don't have the full understanding of the biology, it is potentially risky to, to do that. In fact, there are some diseases or pests that are spread further by, by cutting improperly or pruning improperly, such as oak wilt. Um, so, you know, we don't really have an answer if if that is the right way to go. Um, but I believe there are, is a, a group in New York that is working to experiment on, on pruning and, and um, tree removal. But I would say that, um, you know, that's, that's not my suggestion at this point. So I'll jump back to the USDA Forest Service funding. A second goal or project that we wanted to work on, aside from the symptom progression, was to coordinate national survey efforts. Um, and so we have lots of different states that are now affected, um, different partners, and so we want to try to get on the same page and be able to um, produce some, you know, produce some results from that. So this is a product that we made last year in 2019 with all of the affected counties. So there are 41 if you include the uh, West Virginia here, um, which if you see the, the lines going through it, just to note that there was nematode DNA only, there were no leaf symptoms in West Virginia. So there were four states, um, if you exclude West Virginia, four states and Ontario, Canada, that had 40 counties uh, with beech leaf disease. So far this year, we are seeing more uh, positive counties. So there is leaf symptoms. There were leaf symptoms found in the panhandle there of West Virginia. New Jersey is reporting leaf symptoms. Connecticut is reporting spread um, along the coast there into Rhode Island and even Massachusetts. Um, 
So the Northeast, which, which recently found uh, BLD symptoms last year as a result of somebody um, you know, just out barbecuing for Memorial Day. So what we really need to do is, is get people out and looking um, because there are definitely parts of uh, Ohio and, and other areas that we don't have coded as positive because we don't know what's there, just simply no one is looking. And so really what we want to do is develop a system that can help track disease spread, um, provide training to maybe citizen scientists who aren't familiar with BLD yet but, but want to contribute, um, or even for professionals that um, are you know, out in the field and want to do a quick report of BLD so that we can um, alert other state officials maybe. So what we wanted to do was develop Tree Health Survey, which is an app uh, to be able to, to report out on beech leaf disease. And so this was again in partnership with, with USDA Forest Service and also Kent State University who uh, have been developing the app. It is free on Apple and Android devices. So you can go on and uh, search Tree Health Survey and, and find the app and download it. Um, and then we'll walk through sort of how to use the, uh, a good portion of the remainder here will be um, how to use the app and um, guidelines for, for surveys. So first creating an account, and this is just a, a screen capture of the app. Um, you know, you'll fill in some basic information here, your name, email, password. And then uh, if you're a citizen, you can mark citizen or if you have a professional affiliation, you can mark a professional user, and then you'll have the option of, of picking various categories like, um, you know, I'm a researcher, or I'm a naturalist, or, um, you know, I'm, I work with a specific state government like Ohio Division of Natural Resources. And so we'll check these boxes, and then this option will become available to create your account. And you should see this, this green ribbon pop up once you are, um, have created your account. Sometimes, I've, I've heard reports that sometimes this does not pop up. So even when you click create account, um, and it, it may have a little bit of a lag to it, make sure you go and check your email for a verification link. Um, and also make sure that you remember that your, your uh, email and password are both case sensitive. I've had reports of people not being able to log in because they forgot that they used a capital instead of a lowercase. Um, so either way, make sure when you click create account that you go check your email. You'll get an email and you'll have to click that link, which is valid for one hour. Um, and if you are having issues with that, you can always send an email. Uh, I'll put that up on the screen a bit later. And here is a short video on the, that I put together on navigating and submitting records. And so this is once you're logged in, you've got a, a little about us section, which tells you more about the funding and the project as a whole. Here's a little tutorial for the introduction. And what we're gonna go into is actually uh, creating a record. So we'll go into projects and we'll see two different uh, projects. One is for training which gives you an overview if you haven't even seen a beech tree before, you don't even know what it looks like. Um, it'll give you a training on the bark, on the leaves, um, and on the, on the BLD symptoms. And then there's also an option to uh, create survey points here. So here we've got our app. You can click in the bottom right, the plus symbol, to add a record. And again, this is for the training. You can edit your GPS points if you choose. Uh, you can also change the date or um, see that pop up in a second. Or you can choose to make this a private record. So don't show this to other people. There's lots of questions here, which will give you first a description of, of what's going on, what the symptoms are, and then you can click view image and you get this nice image that uh, loads after a couple of seconds based on your data connection. And it's gonna show you what we're talking about here. So 
So there's a couple more images, couple more questions. Again, a little bit more background on BLD and the symptoms, more nice images. And then once these are all answered or read, you can go down and hit complete to submit your record and just notify us that yes, in fact, I have done the training um, and I am now qualified to go out and start surveying. In the top right here, you see this eye icon, which switches from map view to satellite view, if you want to uh, navigate a little bit differently. And you can even zoom out and see other records that have been, uh, other training records that have been submitted. So across Ohio, Indiana, Michigan, West Virginia, Connecticut. Um, so it's really neat to be able to see that. And here are the actual survey records. So these are all public records that were submitted um, on either public lands or just made available uh, for everyone to see. So we'll go back in on the Cleveland area here. We'll hit the bottom right plus button to add a record. Again, it'll be the same kind of options as before, but now we'll see different questions. Um, I'll pause this for a quick second here. Any of the questions with an asterisk next to them are required mandatory questions, and you will not be able to submit your record until you've answered all those mandatory questions. And you see the red bar, which indicates that you have not answered that question yet. Um, it'll pop up green once you've, once you've actually answered it. So we'll go through a couple of quick questions. Some of them are drop-down menus. Um, some of them are multiple choice. Some are fill in the blank, um, fill in questions. So what county are you in? And then you'll see these green bars pop up. There's also an image question which is required because we do need to verify the symptoms that you're seeing. Um, and so you wanna see you know, what the symptoms are looking like. You forgot what they are, what is a mild symptom. And you can view that image there. And um, oh, there's the image question. So you'll be able to select it from your camera, take a live picture or from your gallery. And once you've answered all these questions that are required, you can go down to the bottom and hit complete. So then just navigating a little bit further, you can click on a point and you actually can bring up the data that was collected there. So this was a record that I, I uh, collected out in the field. So you've got the bark there, some bark, uh, beach bark disease potentially. We've got some other leaf symptoms. Um, and so it's really nice. You can actually see what other people are collecting. And then this video is a bit shorter. This is just gonna show how to edit records. So again, you'll just navigate to uh, a record and zoom in. At this point, we've already filtered based on the map view, so only four records show up. Actually, let me go back here really quick. So this, this button in the bottom left will bring you to your list view. So once you've zoomed in, um, there are four records here in the map view. You click the list view, and then those records will show up. And you can just swipe on that record to be able to edit it. If it's yours, you can edit it. If it's not yours, you can't. And so again, if you've got more accurate GPS coordinates, you can change those. And once all the questions load, um, all your previous answers will show up and they'll show up in green. Um, give it a couple seconds here to load. There they go. And so those are all the questions that I've already answered. And then just hit complete uh, once you're finished and it'll re-upload your new record. So there are some troubleshooting issues um, that, that I've been trying to correct, uh, but when you use the app offline, which is allowed, you may not be able to get those images to load. Um, 
when you come back online, the app automatically tries to resubmit the records, but sometimes they get stuck in the queue. Uh, at that point, I turn on and off airplane mode, uh, which can be found in your phone settings. And um, at that point, it kind of tricks the phone into thinking you're back online and it will try to resubmit. Uh, like I said, the better internet connection here is going to get you faster image loading. And uh, occasionally I have um, issues with verifying your email address. Either you didn't get the email or it went to spam and um, you know now the link is expired. So just send a message to treehealthapp at gmail.com and I can manually verify it. Or again, if you're having any other issues, um, this is this is we just rolled this out a, a couple months ago, so we're still working through some of the bugs. Um, but that gives you a, a quick overview of how to use the app. And and I'll go quickly through the website as well, which is treehealthapp.cmparks.net. Um, this is the home screen and of course if you've already registered through the app you don't need to register again on the website all the same questions there apply um, once you're in the website and you've logged in um, navigating through will be primarily focused on the map section so first you've got my map which will show you any of the records that you've already submitted You've got a project map, which will then pull up the uh, a drop down menu. You can select the Beach Leaf Seas Survey or the BLD Training Project, or if we develop other projects in the future for other pests or pathogens, um, you know, those will pop up as well. And then lastly, you can add edit points here. If you see here, there's 20 records that were submitted in Cleveland. Uh, you can click on that and zoom in. It'll uh, bring you to an individual record. Uh, at that point, if you click on the record on the, the little blue pin and click on more information, just like the app, it'll pull up the, your questions and, and the answers for anyone else who submitted it. The only difference here is you actually have to copy and paste the, this long URL into your browser. Uh, the images don't automatically pop up here. So. That way you can, you can actually view these full screen, which is nice, a little bit bigger than the app on the phone. So going into the add edit points, if you navigate to where you want to drop your pin, click on the map, a little pink marker will pop up. And then you have to click on the pin again and click add marker. From that point, you will see um, this screen pop up and once you select your project, you're in and you can see um, all your questions and, and select your answers. You can right click on the image. There's no image in this first box. That's not a broken link. There's just no image there. Um, you can right click on the image and, and open in a new tab if you want to see it full screen so you can really see those symptoms nicely. And again, before you go into the survey to submit data, make sure you do go through the training and you're very familiar with the symptoms before you start uh, going out into the field and looking for BLD. Again, some quick troubleshooting. Uh, I, I have had some administrative website restrictions from, from folks from different organizations. Uh, I've solved that just by using a different Wi-Fi simply. Uh, so sometimes the administrative restrictions don't let you to get onto the website. Um, but maybe a personal Wi-Fi back home will let you. Again, if you're if you're having other issues, we've um, we've been primarily focused on the app development first, and so we're catching the website up on a couple of areas. But if you see something uh, and you're not sure how it works, or you want to confirm or, or have the bug fixed, just send a message, and we'll try and get get working on that. All right, so now I'm going to go through some quick guidelines on how to survey. So now that we've got the, the knowledge of how to use the app, how to use the website, you know, where are we going to, where are we going to look and what are we going to do? So again, because BLD is first found in the lower canopy, um, we'll, we'll look for saplings or in the lower canopy and, and using that bottom up approach. 
you can spend 30 to 60 seconds per tree if you are you know maybe newer to BLD and you're a little less familiar with the symptoms if you are a professional and you're very comfortable with what BLD looks like this might take you you know five to ten seconds or so as you're walking through the forest and you, you glance at all these trees as you um, you know are looking up into the canopy it'll you'll get faster at it as you become more familiar with symptoms if you're in a small beach stand uh, with fewer than 25 trees you'll you'll want to inspect all of those trees uh, in contrast <clears throat> If you have a large beach stand with more than 25 beach, try to inspect at least 25 trees and scatter them throughout the stand so that you have a, um, you know, you're, you're searching throughout the entire area, not just one small pocket. Uh, in a few slides, I'll, I'll help decide which tree to use as your example when you're answering the questions. Um, but when you find that tree, you'll want to make sure the canopy is visible. And so on larger trees, you may need to walk around the entire tree, try to get multiple vantage points, especially if it is a large tree. Uh, and definitely bring binoculars because sometimes the canopy looks very different for those mature trees up top and uh, as opposed to, to down low where you start to see symptoms first. There's one component that is particularly important, and that is trying to address the symptom severity. So one aspect that we use to consider how severe BLD is, is the percent of the canopy present. So here's a gradient here with, with a full canopy, 100% covered, um, pretty much no leaves missing, and then these are 10% increments going down. We see thinner and thinner canopies until we get to dead or nearly dead trees. The longer BLD has been around, the more likely you are to see symptoms um, or canopies in these lower, lower levels here with, with very few leaves on them. And the other aspect of the symptom severity is figuring out what percent of the canopy present. So even if you, you only have 50% of the canopy present, what percent is asymptomatic, mild, and, and heavy. And so these three will add up to around 100% because it's gonna be making up what is present there. So we're not considering the dead branches in that point. One thing that I, that I do when I am assessing the canopy is, is look around, again, multiple vantage points using binoculars. Uh, you, you divide the canopy into what you see as asymptomatic versus symptomatic. From there, you can try to get a good understanding and, and decide are there more mild leaves or are there more heavy leaves? And so that just, for me, that helps break down um, the, the, the categories here. But again, try to add those up to around 100%. So if there's only a few symptomatic leaves, maybe there's a couple mild and a couple heavy, maybe 95 to 100% are, are asymptomatic healthy leaves. But, but only a small portion are symptomatic. And of course, like I said before, required uh, is, it's mandatory to submit an image. However, some images are better than others. In this case, on the left, we've got a really nice image of a close-up of a handful of leaves. We can clearly see the BLD symptoms here. Um, it's focused, it's clear, um, as opposed to this image here, which is too far zoomed out. It's, it's not capturing a couple of leaves at a close-up view. Um, it's getting too many leaves. Maybe the picture is blurry or just not clear. And another caveat I'll say is if you're looking at a very large tree, you may not be able to get good pictures of the canopy. Of, of symptoms in the canopy. Um, what you can do is look at a small sapling nearby and, and you can take a picture of BLD symptoms there if, uh, if you can't get an image. So we know how to survey 
uh, how, to, how to assess the tree, how to use the app, where do we want to target. Um, this is a zoomed in version of Ohio, and we've got several counties here in the Northeast Ohio that, that do have BLD, but really what we don't know are these counties adjacent to known BLD infection. These are high risk counties. So Carroll, Columbiana, uh, Jefferson, Tuscaroras, Holmes, Richland, Ashland, Huron, these are all counties that are already adjacent to known infected counties, but at the same time, we, we haven't had anybody looking there. You know, we have no idea what's present or what's not present there. So what we really need to focus on are, are areas adjacent to known BLD counties, and this goes for uh, broader surveys as well in other states. If you're in an area with little or no BLD, your first goal and your primary objective is to find beech leaf disease if it's present. Uh, if it's not present, then you can find an average tree to, as your example tree, to do your assessment. So, um, you know, it might be a tree with a mostly full canopy, maybe a little bit of insect damage. Um, just find an average tree in the area uh, that looks pretty similar to all the others. In areas where we've had BLD for several years and it's well established, your goal is to look for the worst symptoms there. Uh, this could be heavy BLD with, with lots of canopy decline and lots of heavy and mild symptoms, or it could be dead trees. Uh, and I underscore that because that is you know, part of our question is how long does it take for trees to die? Are they truly dying from beech leaf disease or are there other stressors involved? And so the more documentation we have of dead trees, uh, the better chance we have to make this, uh, this truly significant issue more widespread as far as awareness goes. We need to get people involved, we need to get people out looking. And so if we can document dead trees, you know, it might be taken more seriously. And then on the flip side of that, we do also want to look for resistant or tolerant trees in areas where BLD has been present for a long time. These resistant trees could be used for uh, breeding purposes uh, to, to find what genes are used in, in this resistance and um, potentially, you know, as a way to to supplement moving forward how to, how to keep our forests intact. And symptoms and maybe different tree sizes. Typically, again, the smaller trees will, will be more impacted than large trees. So if you're taking multiple records, make sure that you're more than 50 yards away from a previous record. And, and definitely take multiple records if you see a drastic difference in symptoms. So if, if one area, you know, 50 or 100 yards away is really heavily impacted, but then you've got a nice healthy canopy over, you know, somewhere else, we'll want to note that. We'll want to see if there is some potential resistance there. And as a general rule of thumb, I'm, I'm just recommending one record per 25 acres, 25 to 50 acres. Um, you know, this, this is at a large scale, right? So if you've got a small woodlot or a private yard and you've got five or 10 acres, but, but you do have a diversity of symptoms and drastic difference between them, that's fine to take a couple of records. We just don't want to overwhelm the system with, you know, one record per acre or one record per tree. Um, so just a, a general rule of thumb, you know, one record for 25 to 50 acres is, is sufficient. And I'll end here with uh, additional resources from clevelandmetroparks.com. If you go to Parks Education Publications, we have a lot of the information I've discussed today, the Tree Health Survey User Manual, which Originally, we focused on just the app again, and we're, we're working to catch up now with the website. So look for a more expanded, thorough guide on the, both the app and website, as well as those general survey guidelines. We'll post that soon. 
We also have other webinars that, that um, were done previously. I did one in February with uh, Dr. David Burke, who talked more about the diagnostic work that he was um, researching with nematodes and bacterial um, populations. We've also got a webinar from, from Dr. Connie Hosman last August, I believe, uh, which, which goes through a thorough history and background of beech leaf diseases and it elaborates on some of those projects I talked about. We've also got a pest alert, which has, again, more information. It's got the map on it of where BLD has occurred. As of 2019, it's got more pictures. It's got a description of, of everything that we talked about here and can be printed out and handed out as flyers or, or et cetera. And we also have technical reports posted there. So, um, Again, clevelandmetroparks.com slash parks education publications. And uh, we'll definitely be continuing to expand that in the future as we, as we come up with more, uh, more studies, more research. And uh, with that, I think I am finished up. I'll, I'll thank my funding sources, the U.S. Forest Service and Cleveland Metro Parks, as well as all of our partners that, that helped collect survey data through LEAP, through uh, Ohio Department of Natural Resources, Kent State University on our uh, treehouse survey development, and uh, everyone here for attending. And then um, as well, OSU Extension, Kathy and Marnie as well, thank you for, for having me. Uh, and I'm sure we've got plenty of time now. We can bring in probably our, our panelists, uh, Dr. Bonello and, and Dr. Cosman, and, and open up the floor for questions. Okay, well, thank you, Daniel. Awesome presentation. Everybody download the app, right, and get started. Um, one thing I will note, you were talking about, you know, those counties that we need to pay attention to outside your counties that you have, um, that you know you have beef. And some working on some woodland projects with us. So what I'm thinking is, well, Eric Draper and I have kind of paid attention to the beach and the woods there, um, the 600 acres that we have at Mansfield. Um, perhaps we take some of our student interns and give them the app and help you survey at least that portion in the Mansfield area um, for beach leaf disease. It ties in really great with their education there on campus. Yeah. So I will keep that in mind. And yeah, we've had a couple of uh, college courses, ec ecology courses, they've gone out as a lab group and, and done lots of surveys. So I think that's really cool. They did that, I think, at um, Hiram and, and maybe a, a couple of other colleges as well. Cool. Okay, so we do have some questions. Um, I think probably the first one here, Holly asked, was has the disease been observed in other locations? We kind of talked about that, but maybe just quickly talk about the range that we've seen it. Yeah, we, we now have BLD confirmed in eight U.S. states plus Ontario um, and more than 40 counties. I, I can't give an exact county count right now. Um, because we're still collecting data, but, but more than 40 counties across at least eight states. Okay. Um, Jack asks, isn't part of the puzzle to identify the vector for how the pathogen moves from tree to tree? Absolutely, yes. Um, that is something that is still being worked out. Again, these, these basic concepts that we don't have a full understanding of are really vital and important to understanding the spread and the movement and and trying to see if there is a way to slow slow it down or combat it so yes we, we don't have an answer there's lots of uh, potential options for us you know certainly birds are, are good vectors of moving things um, other insects <laughs> and um, in fact there's there's a research group with Lynn Carta um, and Ron Ochoa that are working on looking at mites carrying nematodes, carrying, you know, being carried on birds. And so it's like this whole chain of possibilities that, you know, we're still trying to figure out. 
May I provide a word of caution here? Sure. Um, I'd like to make it um, clear to the audience that while the nematode seems to be involved, it's not 100% clear that it is the pathogen at this point. I just want to make that clear because the nematode is found in both symptomatic and asymptomatic plants. At this, at this point, it appears that it is isn't a, uh, um, a necessary perhaps, but not sufficient con you know, condition for development of the disease. So I, I would, I'd like to suggest to the audience that they don't go around saying that it is certain that the nematode is causing beech leaf disease because at this point it is not 100% certain. Okay. Yeah, I think that's a good point, Enrico, and, and I'm glad you chimed in too. It, it's really hard on, on webinars like this to capture all of the research and work that's going into trying to decipher exactly what's, what's happening with beech leaf disease. Um, and uh, Enrico, if you want to take a couple minutes to talk a little bit more about, you know, your work on the diagnostics and, and detection and spread, I think it's important for the audience to recognize that there are a lot of groups that are, are working on it and, and clear um, detection and disease identification and spread are, are still very challenging at this point in time. Yeah, I'd be happy to do that. Uh, first of all, I wanted to actually congratulate Dan because he did an excellent job on the presentation. Uh, in fact, I think you should present some of this stuff at, at one of our bi-monthly meetings. <laughs> I think that would be great. Um, so yeah, we've been doing work at Ohio State uh, using very advanced molecular techniques to try and, and figure out what's causing the disease. And maybe what I can do is um, share the screen if I get, if I have, oh, let me see all panelists. You should be good to go to do that. Yeah, yeah, right. Um, do you want to continue? What While you look up that stuff, Enrico, I'm gonna try to answer some of the questions that have been put through the Q&A if that's okay. Oh, that's fine. Um, do you want me to stop sharing then? No. <laughs> there we go. There you go. Whatever you guys want to do. Go ahead, Connie. No, I'm just, I'm going to type my answers in. Oh. You can talk in the background. Oh, I see. I'm going to try to answer some questions. Okay, okay. Through the chat. So I just wanted to show you, this is um, the, the start of a discussion on a paper that's almost ready for uh, submission of the work that's been done in, in my lab. And, um, you know, forget about the, the acronyms and stuff like that. What we're saying is that there were no significant differences in nematode presence in or in on symptomatic, asymptomatic and naive tissues. Basically, we find the nematode in all different types of plant material, whether they have the disease, whether they are outside of the zone of infestation. And so we find no actual a significant association between the nematode and the disease. Um, what we find instead is that there are four genera of bacteria that are associated with the disease, uniquely associated with the disease. We don't really know what these do, and these are the genera of Wolbachia, uh, Pseudomonas, Serenia, and Panibacillus. Um, I don't want to go into too much detail here. I just want to essentially say that we need to be a little careful when we um, talk about the causal agent. One of the um, issues that were present in the inoculation experiments that were done at Holden, which were done very well, but they used uh, nematodes collected from the wild. And when you collect nematodes from the wild, they can be associated with all sorts of different microbes. Um, so when you inoculate plants with those nematodes, you don't really know if, if the symptoms you get are because of the nematode or anything that the nematode is carrying itself. So um, again, I just want to put out a, a word of caution that folks don't go out and just say this is caused by a nematode and therefore we need to use measures that are uh, designed specifically for nematodes. Um, again, the nematode appears to be uh, perhaps an essential, excuse me, a um, uh, necessary uh, condition. Um, one of the things that's interesting is that the disease appears to be 
concentrated around large bodies of water. So Lake Erie or the Atlantic coast at the moment. Um, now this may be due simply to the fact that that's where people have been looking for the disease or it may be truly um, confined to areas with higher relative humidity in the atmosphere, which tend to favor these foliar nematodes. Um, the fact that the symptoms also tend to progress from the base of the, of the crown of a tree upwards also suggests that the nematodes uh, may be an important component because th these foliar nematodes really um, need high relative humidity to be able to, to operate and, and complete their life cycles. Um, but again, just a word of caution and uh, I'd be happy to take any questions if there are any. I'll stop sharing my screen for the moment. <laughs> so let's see. Let's see. Um, what should we do if we think we've seen it, for example, in Jenks Township, Pennsylvania? Who do we report it to and how do we stop its spread? Um, that goes to the app that Daniel was talking about, I would think, um, unless you have another avenue, Daniel, that you want them I'll, to follow. I'll, I'll comment in on that because um, really what we want the app to do is an early detection. Um, we want it to be a, an avenue for people to be able to report, um, but what we will do is then report it to the various state officials in Pennsylvania or wherever you're from um, and have them also follow up with a field visit to relocate the, the symptoms and possibly take uh, leaf samples for, for further follow-up. So um, you can go to the to the uh, state officials, but we will also send uh, through the app all the information to state officials, which again will have the exact GPS coordinates. It will have, um, you know, a picture verifying so that we don't, you know, that's, that's part of the requirement for, for having the picture is so that we are really seeing the true symptoms that are showing up. I just want to pop in real quick here. Um, Connie is answering your questions uh, in the question and answer box. So if you have your box open, there's a little tab up at the top that says answered. So just make sure you're checking that because she is um, addressing some of your questions. I don't want anybody to miss those answers. Um, so I see one here that says, has there been any research into the spread via root contact? I can take that. Um, there is no, <laughs> there is no, uh, there's been no work so far um, on the root systems. Uh, now, if the nematode was a real, uh, an essential component of this disease, you would think that the root system should not be involved. However, we are starting to look at the root system and uh, we in fact are starting to collect samples, um, actually these past couple of days. Uh, my, my crew went out to um, Cleveland Metro Parks as well as Holden Arboretum and Pennsylvania to collect root, uh, root samples from trees that are symptomatic and asymptomatic. And we will do the, the same kind of analysis we use for the, for the leaves, but there's no, right now there's no, we have no evidence of anything. We just don't have the data even. Okay. Um, Abby does just say that she's seen it. Um, so there's obviously some folks that have out and about, been around it. Um, Sandy asked about any theories as to how the nematode is getting around? Yeah, that's that's definitely part of the question that still needs answered. And, and to Enrico's point, you know, it could be the nematode moving, it could be something else or a combination. Um, and so these are all questions that we Unfortunately, we, we'd love to be able to answer for you at this point, but we just, we haven't had the time and the, uh, the, the effort put in yet. And so we're continuing to do that and we're trying to answer these questions still. Okay. It could be a very complex system where you have a nematode hitching a ride on a mite, which is hitching a ride on a bird. So it's, it's, it could be highly complex. Um, there's just not enough funding at the moment to even try to address any of these questions. 
You know, I always accuse Marnie and her birds of helping us spread. She just gives me grief back, so that's okay. Yeah. Um, much. <laughs> let's see. Yeah. <laughs> Jennifer asks, um, any data on nematode habitat requirements? Does the spread seem to be going more north? We're in the Cincinnati area and are wondering if slash when beech leaf disease may hit us. Yeah, there, there were lots of samples collected around um, trying to look for the, for the nematode. And, and again, to Enrico's point, there are areas that are asymptomatic with, with no leaf symptoms um, that do have levels of nematode that were detected. So it could be that, that in fact, something else is playing a role here. Um, but at the same time, it, it could be similar to any of these uh, diseases that we're seeing, you know, play out right before our eyes, right, with, with uh, COVID. It, it takes, it could take some time for population levels to build up um, and, and to be able to actually have leaf symptoms present. So how are they, you know, how are they moving? What are they doing? We're trying to expand um, and see what, what habitat requirement do we need. Um, moisture seems to play a role. Uh, they, they seem, they might be more, um, they might require water for moving around. Um, you know, a lot of the early detections that we've seen have been near water. So we're starting to incorporate some of those components. Um, the a recent paper by, by the Sharon Reed and that research group um, looked at the the extreme colds. There was an extreme uh, winter, I think in 2019, 2018 to 2019 uh, in Ontario. And, and that didn't seem to impact their, their nematode population numbers. Um, so it, it doesn't, the, the cold may not be helping uh, reduce the levels, but, but again, it, you know, these are all questions that we're still trying to figure out. Okay. Katarina asks, our tree company, Independent Tree, fed our large beech trees and told us to cut down the diseased saplings. We did cut down all the saplings with the disease. What is the correct way to do this to avoid the spread of beech leaf, leaf disease and other diseases? Yeah, yeah, like I mentioned, um, this, that may not be the right option. Um, and, and that's sad because we we don't know what the exact right option is right now, but that might not be it. And that unfortunately could be making it worse if, if we're opening up the tree and allowing more spread to happen throughout a forest. Um, it certainly could be making it worse and it could also um, be reducing the regeneration that you're having in that forest. Um, you know, taking out all those young seedlings and saplings and, and leaving no understory. So. Unfortunately, we don't really have the right answer right now. Um, like I said, we're looking into some treatments and there is a, a group, I believe in New York that is working to see um, what pruning or, or tree removal does. What are the impacts of it on, on the spread of BLD? So I, I can't say with certainty, unfortunately. Stay tuned. Yeah. Um, Abby says, if we don't have a smart device, how can we report it without the Tree Health Survey app. Yeah, so so we made the uh, website option available as well. Uh, so if you do, if you go out into the field and you you know bring a pen and paper, you can record all your information that way, and then come back and uh, and report it on the website. So that option is available. Okay. Um, Jamie says, what is the status of beech bark disease in these stands? We are heavily infested in the ANF, which I'm assuming is the Allegheny National Forest. Uh, most of our beech seeds are sterile, providing no benefit to wildlife. Beech bark disease is creating interference and causing problems when it comes to regenerating desired species. We have entire stands that have fallen apart due to beech bark disease. Without a ton of work and money, we can't mitigate it in order to change the trajectory of the stand and make it healthy. Our forest now is heavily infested with beech leaf disease as well. 
sadly, some of us are happy about this. It costs us a lot of time and money to fight the beach brush to get desired regeneration. My big question is, amount the parent trees will produce a sprouts and for how long? I'm also concerned it will jump to other species. That was a lot. That's a lot. <laughs> There's a lot to unpack there. Yeah, so I'll, I'll touch briefly on the beech bark disease because uh, part of the question is what, what's happening with that interaction, right? Um, beech leaf disease may be taking out the understory and beech bark disease may be taking out the overstory. So it's, it's, it might be a one-two punch here, which is really sad. Um, as far as, as that, we're trying to figure out what those interactions are going to be. So we have monitoring plots that we've established and we're gonna monitor those for long periods of time. We've got areas that are asymptomatic. We've got areas that are only beech leaf disease, only beech bark disease, and then areas with both. So we do wanna see what the interaction of those will be. Um, and the, the part about root sprouts, I think, was, was the next Next part of the question. Yeah, all the, the, the bushy root sprouts that you get because they're dying from beech bark are now seeing beech leaf. So yeah, yeah a lot a lot of the parent trees of beech will produce those root sprouts and they could be doing that when they're stressed, um, but they also just do it naturally in general. So um, I'm not necessarily seeing more root sprouts, um, but that's sort of anecdotal evidence. We haven't really counted the number of root sprouts around a mother tree, um, but, but certainly they're, they're being stressed. And, and in fact, it could be the opposite uh, because we are seeing these saplings die faster. So it could be that the, the mother tree is pulling resources from all of those root sprouts around it to, to try to stay alive longer. And, and we are seeing those mature trees take longer to decline. Maybe, maybe um, that is part of the part of the equation there. Okay. Jim asks, have resistant trees been observed in areas of heavy infestation? Yeah, so that was part of our goal this year was was to get out and look for resistant trees and uh, dead trees. So it's kind of a I see these really depressing sites and then I go and look for really happy sites. So it's a little, it's a little bit of both for me. Um, <laughs> we have seen some trees that look very, very healthy, even, even in our hardest hit reservation. Um, it's, it's had beech leaf disease for now six years. Um, this is North Chagrin in uh, Mayfield and Willoughby, which, which is overlapping into Lake County. Um, there's a tree there, there's, there's a couple of trees, in fact, that have very full canopies, they have very few symptoms, um, and they're overall looking really good. So those are certainly trees that we want to continue to follow up on. But and they are still symptomatic. I think it's important to note that in every area that we have beech leaf disease, we have not ever documented a tree um, that remains asymptomatic. We have no pure resistance, if that's the case. There might be different levels of decline or, or potential tolerance. Um, but like Dan said, that it, it is beneficial and hopeful that there's some trees that are at, at least hanging on longer than others. Yeah, let me clarify that the concept of resistance sometimes is a little, is a little um, confusing because if you're thinking about plants that are completely asymptomatic, uh, due to complete resistance, then you, you would call that immunity, actually. The plant would be completely immune to the pathogen, and that's not the case ever. So resistance is always sort of um, on a scale. Um, and as long as the tree, you know, does not suffer tremendous amounts of, of disease and survives, uh, very often you can consider that plant as resistant. So I just want to to make it clear that it, it, you know, resistance does not mean complete absence of symptoms. Good. Okay, so Dave asks a question. I work in Cincinnati during the week and reside in an east side Cleveland residence, having two infested slash infected um, Vegas grandifolia trees on my property. 
I discovered it this year on the under canopy as you described in its early state. What is the likelihood of vectoring BLD to Cincinnati? <laughs> You're muted, Dan. Yeah. There you uh, go. Yeah, we're, we're trying to figure out, you know, we have to be able to understand how this is moved uh, to be able to answer that question. We are, we're starting to figure it out. Um, but it's always best if, if you're, especially if you're walking around um, near the tree or on leaves that have fallen off, um, those, those fallen leaves can harbor uh, potentially, you know, the, the pathogen, whatever's, whatever's moving around and causing BLD. So certainly we advocate for cleaning your boots, you know, with a, with a light bleach solution um, or cleaning any other equipment or material that may be in contact with or near uh, these be these infected beech trees, because we just don't know exactly what's what's vectoring it. So there's always that potential, and we want to try to reduce that risk as much as possible. That's always the million dollar question, isn't it? Um, so Sam asks, how are the nematodes extracted from the host material? Yeah. So the in fact, I have only been doing some very rough extractions, if you can call them that. Um, I, I've gone out and just because we have an abundance of, of uh, tissue, I can grab a couple, rip them up and, and put them in a Petri dish of water and just using a, uh, you know, a simple dissecting scope or a compound scope, if you can isolate a couple of nematodes. Um, I've been able to find some that way, but there are more sophisticated methods um, which involve maybe uh, centrifuge, spinning them down and into a pellet and actually extracting them, uh, you know, from the leaf tissue that way. So I can't say exactly how. Um, I don't know if anyone else wants to chime in with that or not. Anybody else? They're not gonna go there. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that would be um, more of uh, David Burke and um, uh, Lynn Carta. That, are, that have been doing those extractions. Sharon Reed in Ontario. Okay. Uh, Sam asks, are you interested in negative data, no beech leaf disease symptoms present being reported in the app? Absolutely. Uh, like I said, some of these high risk counties, we just have no idea. Um, we don't know if it's not there or we, we just don't know if people are maybe not looking. So we absolutely want healthy asymptomatic beech trees recorded in the app as well. Okay. Christina is asks, is it known how this is spread, birds, insects, imports? You've kind of covered some of that. Mm -hmm. Whether you want to hit on any of it else? No? No. Okay. Tom DeHaas, work with OSU in Lake County. Do you want more surveys from Lake County, Ohio? Absolutely, Tom. Yeah, we, I've been trying to get out there and see, um, again, looking for potentially uh, either dead trees or, or um, healthy trees. We want to see both. So yes, definitely need more from Lake County. I think it's really important to, to highlight, Dan, for the surveys this year in those counties in Northeast Ohio that have been uh, hit the longest that we are really um, drawn to wanting to document true mortality events uh, of large trees um, so that we can follow up and verify those and whether or not they are um, or can be attributed to beech leaf disease specifically or to this you know, um, conversation of, of, of tolerance, whether or not there's trees that are in still really good shape and have been exposed for the last eight years. So those are the ones from Lake County that I think would be most important to document. Good. There, there's a question for me from Phil Marshall. Um, hi, Phil, I hope you're doing well. The question is, uh, did I hear that future research is looking at root and tree chemistry and physiology to understand how this disease leads to slow decline and death? I wish. <laughs> So we, we have pending grant proposals. So we're looking at the roots in terms of the microbiome, you know, what microbes are there to see if there's any connection between specific microbes and, and the disease. We are not 
at this point planning on looking at um, root and tree chemistry and physiology to understand how the disease is actually killing the trees. Okay. Um, let's see. Jeffrey has a question. Is there, oops, where did that go? Is there a connection to these nematodes invading trees in the area and climate change? Has it been studied? Are other tree species affected by nematodes like this? Um, we haven't been looking at this through a climate change perspective directly. Uh, so we, we really don't know how, how BLD will shift or how the nematode may shift uh, in the presence of climate change. We just don't know. There's, there's so many answers that I wish we, we had, um, but you know, definitely need more interested parties to do these, uh, to do this work. And there's no other tree disease that I know of that is caused by foliar nematode that has this sort of impact. Well, actually, I don't, I'm not aware of any other tree disease caused by foliar nematodes, period. Okay. Uh, Mark Rickey asks, any correlation to leaf litter density as it relates to nematodes slash disease progression? Um, I know that the, the work in from Sharon Reed and, and that group in Ontario, they were looking at leaf litter as, as a potential for harboring nematodes. I don't know if they looked at the density of leaf litter. I think they just took um, individual leaf samples. And so um, they didn't directly look at the density of the litter. Okay. Uh, Mary asked, how small is a small stand of trees? Yeah, I mean, it's, it's uh, subjective. So, um, you know, again, my, my recommendation for one, one record for every 25 to 50 acres is, is sufficient. If you've got a smaller lot, that's totally fine. Uh, but in general, we want you to at least look at 25 trees if you have them. You know, if you've got eight or 10 or 12 trees, that's still worthwhile to record. Um, just look at all of, the, all of your trees if you've got fewer than 25. Okay. Christina asks, possible invasive species carrying the nematode? Don't know. <laughs> um, then the next one is, any regulations being considered for nursery stock or other potential means of spread? Yeah, the um, Department of Agriculture has, has not um, put any regulations in place. Uh, within Northeast Ohio, I, I believe that we've, the nursery industry has, has sort of been self-regulating. If they see leaf symptoms, they're, they're not selling or distributing those. Um, but, but we do know that likely there were some, uh, there was some movement out of Lake County to Ontario. Uh, they were able to track a, a couple of landscape planted trees in Toronto actually. To, to Lake County nurseries. But as of right now, there are no regulations. Okay. Jeff asks, can you partner with Nature's Notebook? They have some challenges to people to do phenology reports on a given area and species. I'd be willing to talk to them and also volunteer to observe at Dawes Arboretum in Licking County. Yeah, that's interesting. I had not heard of that before. Okay. Um, any known stand density basal area relation to infection slash severity? Um, we've, we've been looking at stem density, not necessarily directly basal area, but um, we, there may be a relationship there where more dense beach stems, beach stands with more uh, with higher density are potentially allowing for more BLD to be present, um, more spread locally within that stand. But, but that's something that we are still investigating. So I can't definitively say yes, it's, it's um, suspected. Okay. Fred says nematodes are swimmers, so it would require a wet trunk to get to the foliage. It seems unlikely 
the trunks would remain wet long enough to reach foliage. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Not really a question. Yeah, but I, but I like that point too because um, th it still brings in the question of if, if leaves are falling off, how are they, how are these nematodes getting back up to leaves the following year, right? So, so there's likely something that's doing the vectoring um, from the, the leaf litter on the ground back up as opposed to the nematode actually crawling up the trunk of the tree. And or the fact that some of the nematodes um, are laying their eggs on the buds before, yeah. uh, while it's still there in the canopy. So there's a combination of potential re-inoculation from anything that's fallen to the ground versus those that have already had their eggs laid on, on the buds. The damage occurs inside the buds from the phenology work. We know that there's symptomatic right at, at bud break. And so it's a you know, nematode population threshold question perhaps. Um, so Audrey wants the name of the website. Again, we can pop that back up um, if you want. I don't know, Dan, can you, you want to reshare your screen with that slide and then they'll have it in front of them. Yeah, can you, can, you can drop it into the chat box. Oh yeah, I can do that. That's true. You can post it there as well. Um, her second part of the question is she goes to Cleveland State and was wondering if anyone has reached out to them for additional research. We have not reached out to, to Cleveland State at all yet. But uh, again, there, there are other colleges in the area that have been having their ecology or their field uh, labs go out and, and do data collection as part of their lab. So that's certainly something that, that could be done through CSU as well. I actually graduated from uh, Mary CSU too, so alum. Okay. So Mary says, do you recommend we revisit a stand that shows some disease to upload the progress? Can you repeat that again? I you cut out for a second. Do you recommend we revisit a stand that shows some disease to upload the progress? Oh, yes. So it's like they probably reported it before and do you mm -hmm. want them to go back? Yeah, because that's a good measure of, of how far or, or what has happened over the past year, for instance. I wouldn't necessarily say within the same season, um, but but year over year, yeah, absolutely. If, if you want to start taking an annual record, that would be great in order to, to track the decline of your stand. Okay, so Christina asks, invasive species carrying bacteria with a question mark. Is that why it's recently only showed up? Yeah, we, we don't we know. We don't know. Um, Katerina comes back with her question that they had cut down the saplings and what's the correct way to do this to avoid spread. I think part of your answer was we don't know that that was, that's a good practice, but we also don't know what a good practice consists of yet at this point. Exactly. True? Exactly. Okay. So Jeff says, do the areas with heavy infestations share any common characteristics? I noticed that there were areas with outbreaks located in places far distant from others. Um, we haven't seen any, any environmental difference or, or geographic difference really, or similarity between stands of, of heavily infected areas. So, you know, we're, we're not sure. It could be a number of things. Um, you know, water, distance to water could be something. Density of stems, of beach stems in the area could be another factor. Uh, or it could just be sporadic movement, you know? Where are these, where are Marnie's birds landing, you know? <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Dan. I appreciate the help on that one. <laughs> <laughs> can remember that. <laughs> I, could, I, could add, I could add to that that we are working with um, remote sensing specialists and geographers at Ohio State to try and build um, risk modeling or risk maps for the disease that may suggest, you know, perhaps some environmental parameters that are, that favor the disease. Uh, we're not there yet, but we have some good, good data. Cool. So Enrico, I think this one's for you. If the four bacteria Dr. Bonello mentioned are playing a part, 
is there a treatment for these bacteria that could also be trialed on affected trees along with or instead of the emanect and benzoate and phosphate? So we need to be very extremely careful, okay? Um, <laughs> again, we have data that there's association between the bacteria and the disease. It does not mean causation. To be able to demonstrate causation, we have to be able to isolate those bacteria and then inoculate them into clean plants and see if we can reproduce the symptoms. We're not there yet. Um, we're starting to play with isolation from plant material literally this week. I mean, we've been shut down you know, for the past six months, basically, and we're, we haven't been able to do anything in the lab. Uh, but that's our next, um, the next step. Um, I should say, though, that it's interesting that um, in the in the treatment trials that, that Dan was talking about, um, that the phosphonates actually had uh, an interesting positive effect on the trees. And because phosphonates are really known to be effective against uh, mostly fungal pathogens and some bacterial pathogens. I am not aware of phosphonates being used for control of either insects or nematodes. So the fact that they are um, alleviating symptoms in, in, you know, for beech leaf disease is intriguing. But again, it's, it's, it's still very, very early. Uh, now, I know that emamectin benzoate has also uh, helped. Is that correct, Connie and, and, and Dan? No? So um, the, the one treatment that we know of that um, Bartlett had done at Holden Arboretum uh, was a greenhouse experiment. Um, I believe David Burke maybe talked about that. Dan, you can correct me if I'm wrong at, on the last webinar. Um, I'm not sure that they have, have seen, uh, I think treated trees with the emamectin still ended up having um, symptoms emerge this year. Um, everything right now from, from that treatment application is, is in pilot form. And so our project that we did with, with Bartlett, we were only able to uh, do some treatment last fall, but our inoculations because of COVID, you know, crashed this spring. Um, but some of those trees, even though they were treated last fall, do have some symptoms. Um, but it, it, it's hard to say what's measurable right now. I think we're just too soon. Okay. Barbara asks, could leaf mulch contribute to spread? Is source of commercial mulch traceable? Yeah, since again, since we aren't entirely sure what it is causing beech leaf disease, we don't know how it's moving. It, it could be if it's in the uh, connective tissue and, and we're getting the mulch and moving it around, it could be. Um, if it is the nematode uh, drying out you know, maybe some bark could be help or, or mulch could be helpful, um, but, but really we don't know. It certainly could be playing a role. Okay. Marcia asks, and during the period of nematode population increase in September or October, are there experiments being done to try to find out where the nematodes are and how they're moving around to other leaf buds? Yeah, they, um, I think part of the part of that study was trying to figure out they, they took leaf samples and bud samples at, at different times of the year um, and and also then the leaf litter on the ground so that's where they were showing that you know a lot of the nematodes are found on fallen leaves over winter and they're also found in the buds over winter um, so you know, they're, they're moving around at least maybe from the leaf itself back into the bud or falling off the leaf onto the ground and staying, staying there over winter, um, at which point, again, there could be another a vector some, somewhere that's, that's moving the leaves from the ground back uh, up into the canopy. Maybe we can, we can give the audience an idea of why we don't have more information about this. So, the effort at Metro Parks, I think, is really Dan and Connie and maybe a few interns. Um, no, no interns. Right? <laughs> huh? What's that? Just them. <laughs> no, no interns. <laughs> right, no interns. Right? So the, the two of you, right? 
And at Ohio State, <laughs> and at Ohio State is one graduate student. So, and then Holden Arboretum is basically, it's um, David Burke, right? It, it, there's just isn't, the, the support is not there for, for any more work that we've been able to do. That's how it is. Yep. It happens that way, that way on tree research a lot of times. It's a very small group of people um, that try to answer the gazillion questions that we all have. When oh, the group happens. could be a lot, a lot larger if there were money. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> the if thing, yeah. Enrico. <laughs> yeah. But you know, um, so Jim, knowing how small this group is, what you guys have done is very impressive. I mean, just yeah. the amount of information that is coming out in this webinar, I'm very impressed. So don't discount that, of course. It's all passion. <laughs> it Clearly, is. Yeah. yeah. It is, actually. <laughs> <laughs> For most natural resource people and issues, it's the passion because the other stuff doesn't come with it very often. Yeah. Um, so Jim asks, anyone looking at or on insects specific to beach or at least prevalent on beach that might have might move nematodes or the bacteria around? Enrico mentioned four genera of bacteria. Anything identified to those species level yet? Uh, yeah, Enrico <laughs> says no for the species level. And, and I think really the only uh, insect or, or potential vector that's really being investigated at this point are the mites. Um, and so there are, they, they were able to find nematodes being carried on mites. And so that is certainly a, a possibility, but, but we're really limiting ourselves just to the mites at this point. And as Enrico said, more money than we can, we can study everything. So, um, and it just, okay. it happens to be those mites because nematodes have been found on those mites and those mites are carried on birds, but anything that physically touches a beech branch, any species of bird, any species of bug, uh, can pick up those itty bitty tiny nematodes. So, would you guys like to see, would you guys like to see a video of a of a nematode coming out of a mite? Out of a mite? It? Sure. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> this is a video that this is a video that was provided by. Um, let me just make it larger here. Oops, not this one. Sorry. Uh, that was provided by. Mikhail Kantor, uh, who works in Zafar Handu's lab at the USDA ARS. This is a person who's uh, connected with Link Carta, who's been mentioned before. But um, so here's a mite under the microscope. Um, you see this filament here already. That's that's a nematode. I hope you guys can see this. Um, there's another one here. Oh, wow. oh. Yeah. Yeah. Oh wow. So there there it is. You caught that? Just at the end, yeah. 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 yeah just very briefly. There. So it is obvious that these nematodes can can carry. Excuse me. That these uh, mites can carry nematodes. Um, so I'm going to try to hit some of these we've already answered. Um, Sherilyn asked, should we remove leaf litter in the fall rather than leaving it on the ground where we have healthy beech trees currently in southern Summit County? Well. What, what do you do with that leaf litter once you remove it? Don't transport it for one thing. Uh, you know, if you're gonna remove it, maybe remove it and burn it. Um, but, but even that, you know, I, I don't know. Um, it, it, could be, it could be that that leaf litter is, is playing a role in the, in the reintroduction back into the canopy, or it may be just the end point of some of these nematode uh, life cycle and, and the ones that are remaining in the bud are the ones, you know, perpetuating this disease. So it's still, we don't really know everything, but, but, um, you know, maybe, maybe removing and, and burning the leaf litter is an option. I, honestly, I would jump in and just say it, it would be really important to recognize whether or not you're asking a question about a beech tree in your yard um, or in the forest. So, you know, obviously if it's in your yard, what, what Dan had recommended, um, if it's a landscape-related tree, 
yes, that could be a, a, a good general practice. In the forest, I don't think that there's a, a benefit there to do that. Well, there's a follow-up question here from Mark Rickey that says, any trial on utilizing a very light control burn to reduce leaf cycle of disease in the forest? <clears throat> Yeah, that's, yeah, we have not, we have not even uh, considered that. Okay. Um, last one here, I think, let's see, not a question, but a suggestion. I'm a crazy birder slash naturalist slash master gardener slash Audubon member. All of my colleagues in these groups are concerned about beech leaf disease for various reasons. Please consider getting your message out to these groups, especially Audubon chapters who have members interested in many things in nature besides birds. Feel free to contact me about getting that info. Wonderful. Are we, are we uh, able to, uh, there's, I see an email later down, but will we get contact info from participants? Okay. Marnie will have a list. Wonderful. That she'll send out. Wonderful. Um, Let's see, raccoons are heavily tied to beach. Perhaps this is your carrier from ground to upper canopy. Oh, Plenty of parasites <laughs> associated with raccoons. <laughs> There's that wildlife component Not helping again. me out here. <laughs> <laughs> um, let's see, in regards to spread, is there any evidence that the disease moves via wood transportation, such as removed trees that are chipped by tree service? Yeah, possibly. Another one we don't have an answer to. Yeah. I'll, I'll Kathy, I'm going to jump in here because I see a question from, from Jerry. This disease seems to be spreading very rapidly. Uh, is anyone uh, using the potential for remote sensing or spectral reflectance for detection and expansion? Um, hi, Jerry. <laughs> um, Enrico, <laughs> do you want to take that? Yeah, we are. We are, we are trying to develop these models um, using satellite uh, imagery and spectral data to figure out where the disease could be. Uh, so use it in a predictive manner based on, on risk modeling. Um, we have some preliminary data that are encouraging, but we're not ready to go, you know, full time or what do you call it? Yeah. <laughs> I think one of the difficult okay. projects, and I'm, I'm interested to see how Enrico develops his, is the fact that we're seeing first symptoms in the, in the sub canopy and the lower portion of the canopy first. So those issues of any kind of spectral signature would have to be overall stress signature that the yep. canopy would, would convey. Right. And, and there's good indications that you can get those, those uh, signatures. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Good. All right, guys, I think we're at the end of our questions. So I'll have Marnie stop recording so I can paste the URL Maybe, for the... Sorry, I just hmm? want another question. I'm not sure if we answered this. Um, oh, I asked, okay. could the nematodes be going up in xylem tissue? And maybe that's just another, another un unknown. It's an unknown, but I doubt it because okay. if that were the case, you would almost certainly see wilting symptoms and we don't see those. Okay. I'm going to stop recording. <laughs>